last week we had uh, some powerful testimonies and in fact uh, there was such anointing of testimonies we didn't get time for all of them and while that was happening the Lord gave me the idea for uh, today's uh, lesson called Living the Elijah Principle and that the little picture you see there that's a picture of Mount Carmel that was in that area that Elijah had the contest with the uh, prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel and the, the plateaued mountain in the background is Mount Carmel in, in Israel. Uh, this sermon is going to be a little bit different. It's, I'm, it's going to be kind of a mix of sermon and testimony. I'm going to give my testimony what God's done for me. But I'm going to first begin with a lesson from Elijah's contest with the prophets of Baal to provide a framework uh, God has moved in a number of our lives and it's a, a trip that's, you know, on one hand it shows God working mightily through us, but then we wonder why are we always in these valleys? Why do we have to go through all these problems? I'm hoping through the presentation of this message to ex give a framework to see that uh, while we may feel we're on the bottom, God is actually preparing us to be on the top. And the interesting thing, you know, uh, we're going to be talking about why we're in the valleys. My name translates valley. It's Celtic and it's related to the name Dale. You, you probably have heard Psalm talk about the hills and the dales. Uh, Dale means valley and my name also means valley for whatever reason. So let us here go into the, the, the message part here. What is the Elijah Principle? How does it play out in history? And how does it play out in our lives? You know, the Elijah Principle is a pattern of how God works in space-time history. This pattern was defined in the context of Elijah's contest with the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. This pattern repeats itself throughout history. So let's begin with what happened at Mount Carmel. Well, Elijah went to a divinely orchestrated showdown that would decide which God Israel would serve. Both teams would have offerings in wood, but no fire. The contest was to see which God could ignite the sacrifice. Elijah was outnumbered 450 to 1, with Baal's prophets having much, much more time to work than he did. God stacked, against, uh, God stacked the deck against Elijah to prove his power. Elijah went to a divinely orchestrated showdown that would decide which God Israel would serve and the scripture reference here and most of the sermon part of this message is going to be in 1 Kings the 18th chapter here. In 8, 1 Kings 18, 20 through 21, and the King James reads like this, So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together under Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? In other words, he's saying, How long are you going to be torn between two opinions? Or as the old country music song said, Israel was torn between two lovers. And Elijah was feeling like the fool. They weren't feeling like the fool because they were asleep. But it, it's, it, Israel was torn between two lovers. Was they going to be devoted to God or to Baal? And so Elijah was here saying, How long are you going to just stand here between these two? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. The people didn't answer a word. Both these teams would have offerings in wood, but no fire. The contest was to see which God would ignite the sacrifice. And we read on here in 1 Kings 18, 23 to 24, it says, Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. So everyone was in agreement we were going to have this contest to decide whose God was God. 
Now, Elijah was outnumbered 450 to 1, with Baal's prophets having much, much more time. You know, it, it, then said Elijah unto the people, <coughs> I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Baal's prophets worked for 12 hours versus Elijah's 20 seconds. Time wise, Elijah was outnumbered 2,160 to 1, and the, the math is simple. There's three 20 second intervals in a minute, there's 60 minutes in an hour, and there's 12 hours. Uh, and so that you add that up or you multiply that, and that comes out to 2,160. And then here's a scripture that lays out the, the time here. Uh, the, pass, the passage in context would be 26 through 29, but for brevity, I just posted the verse 26 and verse 29. And they, which is referring to the prophets of Baal, took the book which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answered, and they leapt upon the altar which was made. And between the two sets of three dots, Elijah pokes fun of him and says, Oh, maybe your God's using the restroom. Elijah was having a ball because he knew what the outcome was going to be. And then in verse 29 it says, It came to pass when midday was past that they prophesied till the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Uh, early morning on their reckoning would be about 6 in the morning to 6 at night. So from 6 in the morning to 6 at night the prophets of Baal were doing their thing uh, it even uh, got to the point where they were cutting themselves. They were just working up a frenzy, doing everything they could with their fleshly power to trigger cosmic forces that would bring Baal to answer. No answer. You see, God stepped the Dak against Elijah to prove his power. If this was merely a matter of natural course, Elijah didn't stand a chance. And the deck isn't even done getting stacked here. Elijah was outnumbered 450 to 1, you know, people-wise, when you count the amount of time that they had to pray up something. Elijah then was outnumbered 2,160 to 1, but it's not done here yet. And verse, passage here is 1 Kings 18, 31 to 35. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid them on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt offering, and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. So the sacrifice in the wood was underwater. How is Elijah, how is that going to catch on fire? In the natural world, that's not possible. But as we know, with our God, all things are possible. So you see, God stepped the deck against Elijah to prove his power. And here in verses 36 to 37 is the 22nd prayer. It might have taken him less than 20 seconds even. Very short prayer. Elijah didn't work up a prayer here. It was very simple and to the point. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and hast turned their heart back again. What happened? God proved his power. And boy, did he prove his power. He first proved it by lighting it. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. I want to make a comment there. God didn't just cause a chemical reaction to burn up the wood. This was a complete annihilation of everything. There was, there was an empty spot by the time God was done. He completely consumed the entire offering. 
And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. The prophets of Baal went down in defeat. They were destroyed. And God still proven His power. God sent the rain. Right afterwards, God sent the rain. And He did another little miracle while He sent the rain. I put in my notes here, He turned Elijah into the flash. You know, and what's, what's happened is that Elijah had previously shut up the windows of heaven so that there would be no rain. For seven years, they had a big seven-year-long famine because of Israel's uh, sin, because of the hardness of heart, because of the idolatry that Israel was worshiping the Baals. And now that the strongholds were defeated, it was time to turn the rain on. It was time to send the rain. And this was little rain, but it prefigures revival. We can think about, you know, America worshiping the Baals. And this is done figuratively, but even literally, they're in some of these cities, they're, you know, removing the Ten Commandments and setting up monuments to Baal. So as, you know, these strongholds were destroyed, there's a process where the Elijah principle was done that God stacks the deck against us so that these strongholds can be destroyed and God breaks through. And when God breaks through, there's no question God did it. Amen. You can't say, oh, somebody worked it up or oh, they had a hidden mic and, you know, somebody was, they were hearing what the sickness was through the mic. You know, when, when you know, God will take us to that dark place and when He comes through, even the skeptic will have to say, I'm not a believer, but your God, there's something real about the God you serve. And in verses 41 to 46, we see here, and Elijah said to Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Elijah spoke it forth before there was any sign. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down to the earth, and put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, go up again seven times. Elijah had the, the fountains shut so tight, it took him one time to shut it, but it took him seven times to open it. Have you ever twisted a can shut, and then, you know, sometime later you go up and you're having to, Ugh! That's what Elijah had to do through the Spirit. It took him 20 seconds to call fire down, but it took some effort wrestling the Spirit to get the rain to come. And it came to pass that the seventh time he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto him, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. In other words, they need to get to their destination before the rain overtakes them. Elijah, you know, Ahab's in a chariot going 35, 40 mile an hour in the chariot. But God's not done working a miracle here. It says here, And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and smoke, and there was great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. Elijah girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So if you can imagine somebody going like this and just running like the flash. Elijah was running 40 miles an hour for 18 miles. Elijah was the fastest man alive that day. Not only do we, so we not only have the story of the strongest man in the scripture, but the fastest man. And this, but this day of glory for Elijah came after a, a hard time in the valley. A hard time of, of oppression. And it's not just with Elijah, but it's a pattern that God uses here. And I want to just bring a few references on how this plays out in history. We see this throughout the Old Testament. Israel forged their national identity as Egypt as slaves prior to supernatural liberation. Moses was rescued from death he fled, and he fled to the wilderness. So Moses experienced this several times in his life. Moses had a, a bullseye on his back. The Pharaoh wanted to kill all the children. Amen. Moses escaped. Moses grew up in Pharaoh's court, and in the modern thinking of today, uh, and in the Ten Commandments, Nefertiti said, play your hand. And people, you know, everyone wants to play their hand. What can we do to build our platform? 
What can we do to get our voice out there? Just play along. She, she was telling them, play along and you'll be the Pharaoh one day. Amen. But that wasn't what God had in mind for Moses. Had Moses done it, he could have been Pharaoh. Would the Israelites have been set free? Maybe, maybe not. They would have become Egyptians. Everyone would have become Egyptians and the story would have ended. But Moses chose to suffer with the people of God. He fled Pharaoh and lived in the wilderness for 40 years and then labored with Israel another 40 years in the wilderness until not only, you know, it, it took them a few days to rescue Israel out of Egypt, but it took them 40 years to get Egypt out of the hearts of the Israelites. David fled Saul prior to becoming king, and David, he, he lived this on multiple levels too. David was at one point so insignificant, he was the youngest son of Jesse. And when Samuel came and said, one of your sons is going to be king, Jesse didn't think David was even worth the bother to call him. He, David was left in the field. David was abandoned to be the shepherd in a sheep coat. But, but Samuel said, we're not sitting down until you call David. After the other seven sons was passed, and Samuel said, is there any more sons? Is this all you got? And Jesse said, oh, oh, we got David, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, we're not sitting down. Well, David, and then David fled Saul, fleeing for his life, living as a fugitive, on the run for the law when he did nothing wrong. So you see, David had the stack deck, uh, stack deck against him. Elijah and Obadiah were oppressed prior to the victory of Carmel. Elijah had raptured himself away from Ahab while Obadiah hid the prophets of God in a cave. And in fact, the first part of chapter 18 is the story of a conversation because Elijah calls Obadiah and says, Go and summon Ahab here. And Obadiah says, Why are you trying to kill me? Because I tell him and he'll come and you'll be, you'll be whisked away and then he'll kill me. And he said, I've hidden the prophets of God in the cave. Why are you wanting me to kill him? And Elijah said, trust me, I will show myself. I won't slip away. And Obadiah then sends the message to Ahab, and from there we have the contest at Mount Carmel. Attempted Jew Jewish suicide under Haman prior to victory. And that was a great victory, and the, the account of that's in the book of Esther. Then another attempted Jewish suicide under Antiochus Epiphanes prior to the Maccabean Revolt. That resulted in the Maccabean Revolt and uh, uh, independence for Judea prior to the Romans coming in. We also see this in the New Testament church in subsequent history. Jesus' birth, earthly ministry, death, and resurrection. I could have a whole sermon on, on the sufferings of Jesus. And they didn't begin at the cross. Jesus, like Moses, was a fugitive at birth. He then suffered his earthly ministry. Uh, he didn't have the ministerial credentials. His credentials came from God through the Holy Spirit. He didn't have the favor of the Pharisees and spent much of it fighting the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And obviously his death was probably the greatest example of the Elijah principle. He was dead or in a doornail for three days. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. Resurrection power. The early church overcame persecution to displace pagan culture. And just a little tidbit here. To show how Christianity as a religion illustrates the Elijah principle of the major religions. Christianity is the only one that did not become a state religion within the lifetime of its founder. In fact, Christianity didn't even start during the lifetime of its founder. Jesus was dead and then raised from the dead. So Jesus died before Christianity even became a thing. Because it started at Pentecost. You know, Jesus was raised, glorified at the right hand of the Father at, at that point. But the church overcame it, replaced pagan culture, ended up uh, millions of people now follow Jesus. And the official estimates are almost 2 billion people are followers of Jesus. Are they all going again? Probably not. But millions of people genuinely follow Jesus today. And it did it through the most improbable circumstances. John Wycliffe and the Lawlers or the Hussites start the Reformation under persecution 
prior to Luther's nailing of the 95 Thesis, which results in a tremendous political paradigm shift. And in fact, we get our phrase, you, you all probably heard the phrase, cook your goose. We got it from John Huss. Huss is a bohemian for goose. And he made a place saying, they haven't cooked my goose yet, off of his name. And that's where we get the phrase, cook your goose. We got it from John Huss. <laughs> that, that's where we got it. But, you know, the, and a lot of people think that Luther started a reformation, but it had been going on. But what Luther did, that shifted the, polit the politics of Europe, where the, the Roman Catholic Church didn't dominate European politics anymore. You know, Count Zinzendorf, he assembled a bunch of persecuted people at a place called Hernhut and jump starts a hundred year prayer meeting. And a little interesting tidbit, Count Zinzendorf starts his prayer on August the 5th, 1727 on my birthday. Wow. And then on the 6th, they from the 6th to the 13th, they have a prayer meeting and on the 13th, God breaks out, a mighty revival. This prayer meeting, this revival influenced Wesley and uh, John with the Wesleys and it influenced George Whitfield. It's, you know, in many ways it, it shaped evangelicalism to what it is. A mighty revival came. It influenced the early awakenings that happened under Wesley and Whitfield here in the United States. So, Azusa Street Revival that started Pentecostalism was started by black holiness believers who were oppressed and marginalized. So you see, there is a pattern that plays out throughout history. The people that God uses to do the great things didn't start out in the palace. They started in the wilderness. Oppressed some of them were fleeing for their lives. Their lives were under threat. And of these examples, the only one whose lives were not under threat was the Azusa Street Revival. But at the turn of the 20th century, it was not a good time for blacks in America. Blacks were persecuted, oppressed, and marginalized with a lot of racism. And racism ended up cutting the Azusa Street Revival short from what it could have been. That could have brought the final great awakening, but because of racism, because of a lust for power, a lust for those platforms that was cut short. But it was started, but God used people that was oppressed and marginalized to do so. The final great awakening will follow this pattern. Don't expect it to come from high profile ministries with millions of followers. It's not likely to come from there. It's going to come, it will seem to the public to come out of nowhere. Because that's, you know, People will just say, wow, God's moving. I never heard of them before. And they never heard of before because we were in the wilderness. Those that God chooses. And it's the Elijah principle. The people God's going to use for the final great awakening are people that's had the deck stacked against them. That's had two strikes against them from the get-go. Who've had the struggle. And at this point, in, in all of these cases... God's people were both equipped and raised in improbable and even miraculous ways. This is how God works in history. And this is also how God works in our life. And at this point, I'm going to kind of shift a little bit in the message. And I'm going to share my testimony here. Because I have that here. Uh, but I want to recap here. In every major move of God has had the Elijah principle as a feature. God would also show up every time his people were in a predicament failed to the success of God's history. If Elijah lost, that would have been the end of the story. The story would have been over with. None of us would be Christians today. Had Jesus lost, that would have been the end of the story. Had Jesus sinned, had he even as much as told a little white lie, that would have been the end of the story. But God always showed up when, it, when he had to show up. And many times, that's when he waits until the absolute last second. So, you know, when we see the struggles our church goes through, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. It's, and, and Bev, don't be down because of what's happening with Ray. And I can sense through the Holy Spirit that you're feeling down. Don't be down. Hang in there. 
We all hang. We all need to hang in there. When we, and, and you know, I know that day we couldn't hold services. That was kind of a depressing weekend for me. You know, and you know, it was throughout the church. And Pastor Chris brought forth a word. He said, "Don't think of it as the enemy attack. God had ordained it for some reason, and at that time he did not know what it is. But God has given me some additional revelation on that. God did it to mark." New Covenant Church of the Apostles as a beneficiary of the Elijah principle. Amen. God stacking a deck against us because he's about to do something big. Yes. Amen. Yes. You know, God will also work this way in the lives of believers today, and that's what I'm getting to here to, to found his next great work, the final great awakening. I have such a testimony here that I want to give in the spirit of showing how this framework reveals how God chooses to equip people. And I hope that I don't break down when I give it because it's it, the testimony is a doozy. Just as a disclosure here, uh, some heavy things are going to be revealed here. Some of them that hasn't been revealed to more than just a few people. I was almost never born having passed through pre, two pre-birth crises. Uh, the first one was simply due to my parents' age. My mother and father were both almost 45 years older than me. And my mom never went through menopause. Her pregnancy with me and my birth was her menopause. And after I was born, there were no more periods. She was done having kids. So it's entirely... And at that time, her and my dad just didn't get along very well. Uh, I doubt they did much of what married people do. There was a lot of fighting. There was abuse that went on in the household during the time my mom was pregnant with me. And it is entirely possible that November of 1967 was the only time that year that they came together as a married couple. So it only took one time. So my conception was very improbable. If the natural course had followed, I probably would never have been conceived. Dallas Carter would never have existed. But God wanted me to. And I was conceived in, in trouble. Before I was born, my dad used to beat on my mom. And while she was praying with me, he would deny that I was his. Like I said, I, I, I wasn't kidding when I said this is going to be heavy, but I think this needs to be told. And the Lord had given me some revelation. I've got partial confirmation in, in conversations with my brothers. You know, they didn't give a lot of detail. But he had given me, you know, at one point, he was going to beat her while she was pregnant with me. And I remember from the family tales that there was one time that was so bad that both of my brothers got between my mother and my father. At first, it was my oldest one, Calvin. And then my dad was going to, you know, fight him. Then my brother Curtis steps in. And between my mom and my dad, it was both of my brothers, they were 15 and 16 at the time. They were scrappers. They, they used to get in, you know, had to fight to defend themselves, you know, going to Silver Creek, you know, they would get ganged up on. They would tell tales that sometimes they had to fight five or six off. Every day when they go home from school, during that time, Sellersburg and I think Charlestown, you know, they, they, they both had a reputation for her being rough towns. And they, they had to deal with that. And they was prepared to defend their mother. Now, I, I am convinced the grace of God was in this because my dad was a professional boxer. He fought in the military uh, under Joe Lewis's card. He never really made a career of it. But he did box, and it is considered professional boxing. He knew how to box. And my dad was a monstrously strong man for a man his size. So I have no doubt that if he was determined to do something, that he probably he could have handled my brothers pretty easily. But for reasons unknown to the natural, he stood down. When they both stood against their father, he backed off and... So I survived getting beat out of my mother. I survived getting aborted by my dad's fist. Because God had a plan for me. The deck was stacked against me. 
this happened a little bit later where I was almost destroyed by institutional educational neglect before I entered school. And just a little note here, for a lot of children that were born in the 60s and the 70s, there were a bunch of people who were falsely committed to special educational system. They were misdiagnosed as, as mentally retarded. They would go into the special ed system and of course they never, there they didn't get any education. And they, a lot of them. The public schools wanted to do that to me. But my mom fought them hard. She fought them savagely. Bitterly opposed it. And uh, she, we finally, she enrolled me in this Catholic school. It's no longer open as a school. It's just a community center in Starlight now. But for years it was St. John's Elementary School. And she talked to Assistant Mary Carroll, and she said, well, we'll let him in and see what happens. They had me go to learn the alphabet. I learned the entire alphabet in a day and a half. I learned it before the rest of the kids in the class were. I would later, in fifth grade, take an IQ test, and I tested at 133. Uh, guy named Norm Spencer said, this is genius level. They, they really goofed, and at that time, that's when I learned from him. He said there are a lot of people your age that they misdiagnosed and some of them ended up. So that God spared me. Now you may ask here, with, with all this going on, where's the grace? Where's the love? I thought God was a God of love. But I see God's grace all over this. God spared me at every point where I could have been destroyed, at every point where my life could, where my story could have ended. And in my case, my story could have ended before it even begun. I could have ended up never even existing. And I don't know what Ann would be doing today. She would be, if that happened here, her name would be Ann Carter today. And it doesn't, it, you know, it, it doesn't end there. I was subjected to daily verbal abuse and family drama by my alcoholic father. The reason why my dad was a monster was alcohol. And everyone that knew him talked about what a good guy he was when he wasn't drinking. He was good as gold when he wasn't drinking, but alcohol destroyed him. There's a reason why they refer to alcohol as spirits, as distilled spirits. Because ultimately there are demonic spirits that are behind it. That they worm their way in when you drink and you have this alcohol problem. They try to pull you in, which is why deliverance from alcoholism involves not only steps to not drink alcohol, but spiritual warfare to come against those demonic spirits. Amen. There were, my dad was a monster because there were devils that didn't want me to be born, and if I was born, they wanted to make sure that I would amount to nothing. And that's what my dad would say every day. Every day, not a day would go by where he wouldn't hear dummy and you're not going to amount to anything. Every day until, almost until he died. He died when I was 12 years old. My earthly father taught me the ways of alcoholism and lawlessness. He, was, he sent me down a path of juvenile delinquency. Now, when I was nine, my mom filed for divorce. So the abuse in the home ended. But he was still in the picture. And, you know, you still the abuse and manipulations. My dad would bring stuff in and say, this is hot, this is hot, this is hot. And on one occasion, I was visiting my dad. I see he had this 32-ounce can of Budweiser, and I go and I drink it. I drink about half the can, and I end up having a date with the toilet. <laughs> Barfing, and, and Mom come up and said, Son, I want you to tell me the truth. Did you drink? I go, Yes, I did. Am I going to be punished? She said, No, I think you've suffered enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, but he was sending me down that path of juvenile delinquency. I was almost killed three times before I was 12 years old. You know, the first one I had already talked about domestic violence. When I was eight years old, I was playing out in the country roads in Starlight, and I went across this road. And I was crossing the road, and 
being a foolish kid, I wasn't watching, didn't care there was a truck. As soon as I crossed that road, I could feel the wind of the truck passing me, and his mirror was just inches. What if I would have tripped or went a little bit slower? Splat. And then, you know, while I was out there, I when I lived in Starlight, I used to live in a house by the, that school there, and I would play out in the country, and one day somebody came in, and they suspected it was a serial killer, a bad guy. And they had even told my mom, don't let him go out and play, and pull me in. He had already shown up. I got to meet the guy. The same day this bad guy coming in, this dog came into my life that I named Blue. He was a stray. I don't know where he come from, but he came from and he stood by me and would not leave me. And when I went home, he went home with me. And I said, can I keep him? Can I keep him? At first they wasn't going to let me because they didn't want another dog. And uh, I think what persuaded them was finding out that that guy was in the neighborhood. And I, you know, they ended up letting me keep him. I named him Blue. God sent a dog to save my life, to preserve my life. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. So, even, you know, the point I'm making this is, you know, we, we tend to think God's grace isn't in things because we're feeling bad. But God's grace is all over. God, as we go through things, God preserved Elijah when Elijah was suffering. God would rapture him away so that Ahab could not. And then, I was gloriously saved at 12 years old, June the 21st, 1981. And it, it began when a guy named Calvin Paris knocked on my door and said, do you want to go to church? Now, I had previously went to the Catholic school, but I hated their mass. That was the longest 45 minutes of the week. And I thought, I love God, but I hate church. So I have no natural clue why I said yes when he when Calvin Paris invited me to church. But I said yes. I now know that it was the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit was the grace of God drawing me. Otherwise I wouldn't have went because my exposure to church was that's boring. So I go to church. You know, and God had was previously working on me because I was going down that path of lawlessness, and at that time there was this girl I was interested in uh, trying to figure out where can we go to do you know what. I was a preteen and, you know, the, the hormones were starting to kick in and I was starting. So I was going down this bad path. It got so bad, Mom took me to the prosecutor to have him scare me. Uh, some of you might remember Jerome Jacoby. Some of the, he was a prosecutor here for many years and, and then became a judge. Well, he gave me this spiel about what could happen if you're a juvenile delinquent, and that lasted about a week, and then I was. But I went, so I asked my mom, am I, am I going to go to heaven? And she gave me an answer that was comfortable but untrue. She said, only the really bad people go to heaven. Problem is that we're all really bad people without. So, but I was, you know, convicted and unsettled. So I go to church. James Robinson is in town at Graceland Baptist Church. And he asked this question. I forget what all he talked about other than one question. That's the only thing I remember. He was there and he asked this question. He said, if you were to die tonight, are you for certain you would make heaven? At that moment, I realized I was headed to hell. I realized that I was in trouble with God. And so I, you know, so I went back, you know, and except end up going to vacation Bible school, I accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. And it was, I've enjoyed it ever since. There's been a lot of tough times in that interim, but God has always been with me. Jesus Christ is the one constant. Remember I <laughs> talked about how, you know, God not only chooses you in the wilderness, but He prepares you. David, for example, learned to fight in the sheep coat. He didn't learn to fight in the military. He was already skilled, 
before he got in the military. Of course, they trained him on how to use those weapons once he got in the military, but he defeated Goliath with a sling. He learned to fight fighting lions and tigers and bears, literally. Uh, with, you know, when David took, gave Saul his case for why he should be allowed, he said, I killed the lion and I killed the bear. I just threw in the tiger for good measure with the Wizard of Oz. But David learned to fight in the sheep coat, being a shepherd. The place where his father abandoned him and thought it wasn't even worth the while to call him to have supper with the prophet, with the prophet of God, Samuel. While David was abandoned there, he was learning. And so God prepared, he also prepared me for ministry using improbable means ranging from reading encyclopedias as a child to self-study reading as an adult. You know, I learned systematic theology in the math classroom. I was always I was fascinated with math when I was getting to high school, especially geometry. That was my favorite subject. I would learn these theorems. And, you know, thought, wow, this is neat, you know, how God put together the universe mathematically. You begin with one thing being true and go step by step. You know, and as an adult, I learned and got the equivalent of a degree in theology without having ever been to theology class. The closest I was to a Bible study classroom was that uh, a friend of mine a close friend of mine was in it and we would talk theology. And when I met Pastor Ray, I was 28, he was 48. And one of the things he marveled was that I knew what I knew without having had any formal theological education. Uh, I, I talk like somebody that had a Bible college degree, but I've never been in Bible college. It was the grace of God. He was preparing me through some very improbable ways, equipping me for the ministry that he was calling me to do. You know, the apostles didn't go through, except for Paul. None of them went through formal education either. But people took note that they was with Jesus. And God has a way of doing that. And he gave me ministry opportunities in improbable places, ranging from abortion clinics, small groups, Supply preaching pulpit. Supply preaching simply means the pastor's out. He's on vacation and somebody else is called in, brought in, and they present the sermon that day. Sometimes an associate pastor may do it. Here at New Covenant Church of the Apostles, we have a team of pastors. We don't have a senior pastor, but a team of pastors. But, you know, every once in a while we may bring somebody in just to have a different voice like we was intending to do with Caleb, and uh, of course, unfortunately, that didn't you know, work out. God had other plans that weekend. And online ministry. You know, I, I learned HTML, you know, because I figured if I wanted to get my message out one day, that I would need to go online. So I taught myself HTML and ended up getting professional grade web design skills, again, without going to school to... And, you know, God also arranged for me to be put in marginalized places in society in the job market that could not be explained by natural causes. I was crucified to the world before understanding what that was. And I know I'm not the only one, but I would wonder for years, I would realize I'm in these job situations that weren't the best, and I was watching people pass me by, wondering why. I said, Lord, why? Why, why am I chained to the bottom? Because I felt like I was just chained to the bottom. Like I was just under this thumb, couldn't get anywhere. This is actually quite typical for those God has prepared. The saints were all under the thumb. They were not only marginalized, they, many of them was persecuted. Fleeing for their lives. And this is how God works and this is how he worked in my life and, and for years I didn't understand I said was there demonic strongholds have I sinned some great <laughs> sin and this is the judgment of God on Dallas Carter that I'm just consigned to be at the at the bottom here and, you know and I would watch enviously while these people were just they seemed to be living lives of comfort while I was struggling 
you know, I, I ended up getting an IT degree and wondered why some of these people were just cruising along while, you know, I end up having to still go back to work in a factory or a warehouse. But you want to know something? God's chosen will typically come from underprivileged origins. His chosen will typically get some or all of their preparation for ministry in the wilderness rather than the seminary. And God's chosen will typically find their station life be to be below their pay grade with no natural explanation for their underprivileged status. And God's chosen will typically have a testimony of one or more times they were spared from death in a close call. And just to, uh, to kind of frame it in the frame of reference of New Covenant Church of the Apostles, all three of us pastors have at least one time that we've been spared from death. You know, with, in some cases, seconds. Just a few seconds different, and it would have been. God is good. Yeah. But God spared us. He, I have been spared seven times from death in close calls. You know, I've talked about the three times before I was 12. Twice on my 25th birthday, close calls... Uh, I, I was riding a bike across the 2nd Street Bridge and flipped, and if I would have flipped just a certain way, I would have fell in the river. Then I almost get run over by a car by what is now Kroger, but then it was Kmart. And then uh, a couple of years ago, several times we had close calls driving to Charlestown and Henryville. I almost went off the road on Highway 403 one time. And then another time in Henryville, the semi pulled right out in front of us and I had to veer off the road. Uh, several of those times, Ann was with me. You know, it's one of those after you're done, your heart goes ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. God was good. God still has a purpose. And the reason I'm sharing all this and I'm sharing my testimony <coughs> is for us to have faith that we are actually in a good place. We're not in a bad place. We may feel like we do. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a bad place. But we're in a good place. Because God allows you to get to this dark place so He can prove His power. So that when He moves, nobody can say, God didn't do that. Nobody can say, oh, you, you're superior intelligence, you're superior wit, you know, or you just got lucky. They will know that God showed up. The pathway to victory is likely to be improbable. The pathway to victory may involve miraculous intervention or God may provide improbable pathways. Was it going to be for us? I don't know. I've, I've spent a lot of time struggling Well, how am I going to get there? But it is really more important to know God will make a way than to know the mechanics of that way. If you need to know the mechanics, God will show you the path to go. You know, it could be, you know, God may, you know, simply continue to providentially provide we grow bit by bit, or something may happen. You know, in the day, age of the Internet, you may never know that that next post doesn't go viral. That's right. And suddenly you're there. But it's more important to know that God will make that way than to know the mechanics of that way. And so in the meantime, that's where we want to, you know, continue to press in fervent of actual prayer, prayer, pray for wisdom, pray for God's power to show up. Satan would love to say, look, look out there, look, look what a pitiful spectacle you are. He's, you know, and, and Bev, I'm sure the enemy's trying to tell you horror stories that he's going to, no, I'm going to tell you, I am just mad at the devil. Yeah. Okay. I've been through a lot with Ray. Ray, mm -hmm. I've been through cancer with Ray. Mm -hmm. I've been through a lot of things with Ray. That. No, I am angry at the devil. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's yeah. mostly, but I also know that I know for sure the thing is that God has always made a way for me. Always way. made a way. Yes. Always. I mean, when he was on, you would think deathbed. God raised him up, and God has taken care yes. of him. So, yeah. And God will make that way for us. 
He will make that way for new yes. coming to church of the apostles. He evidently is scared of something. Yeah. That's because why our church was hit church wide. Right. God is telling us that new coming to church of the apostles is a recipient. And so what we need to do is when we go through this, just like you know, Sister Bev talked about, have faith. God's always going to make a way. Even if we have no clue what it is, right. God's going to make a way. Something is going to turn up that's going to turn it around. I mean, am I sad? Yes, I'm sad for what happened. That's why I cried. I didn't need to do that with Chris, but because I'm usually a very strong person. But yes, I hate what's happening. I don't like the devil beating him up. I don't like yeah. all that. But he is going to do that because where we're going, he don't want us to go. Okay, this is bigger than you even can ever think. Yeah, of far far so. bigger than we can imagine. It's what's going to happen. Yes, you know. Part of the discipline of living the Elijah principle is to get us to the point where we don't judge our lives based on what's immediately going on around us, but to think conceptually about God's big picture. What is God doing? And it is important to see it through the, uh, things conceptually through the Elijah principle and trust that God has chosen you rather than to, after the course of the flesh, look only to the immediate situation and, and do that. And... You know, we all are tempted to do that, and that's uh, how the unbelieving world is. When Adam sinned and he lost his connection with God, then man largely behaved like an animal, a talking animal going all of just what's immediately around us. And, you know, if you're an animal out in the wilderness, that, that actually helps you because if you're not alert to what's going on around you, you might be dinner. Yeah, right. But God wants us to get beyond that back to seeing through the eyes of faith through God's big picture yes. and trusting that God is going to provide that way rather than just running with. Mm -hmm. But the unbelieving world can only think in terms of the immediate and an immature believer will often think that way. That will often be the default as they're learning to walk by faith and not by sight. You know, they'll, they'll trust in the immediate circumstances and whatever sinful pattern they fall back to. Some people will, when they get hit, fall back to drinking. Others, it may be lust or pornography. <clears throat> Others, it may be violence. Or Each person experiences the fall in a different way. But God wants us to be centered that when this thing happens to understand that God actually has us where He wants us yes, because of what He's going to do. And if you're seeing the pattern of the Elijah principle in your life, then that's God's way of saying, I've chosen you to do something great. Trust in me. I'm going to come through. Amen. And the prophets of Baal are going to fall. The strongholds of the enemy are going to fall. The final great awakening will happen. No matter how improbable it may seem from where we are, don't let the enemy say, we don't got the money, we don't got the people, we don't got that platform. God didn't care. God told Moses to walk away from it. Well, he told Moses what he had in your hand. Yeah. Because yeah. the staff he had was more powerful than all the platforms and weapons and armies of Egypt. Right. And so, you know, we're to trust in God. 